Today, we'll hear from the entrepreneur who literally took the biscuit, but then brought it back. This is the Architects of Business, Joe's weekly series of interviews with the business leaders who are forever cooking up new ideas. I'm Ty Genwright, and today I'm meeting Michael Carey, who had the sad task of closing the iconic Jacob's Biscuits factory, but later the joy of launching a new Irish bakehouse. Michael Carey, great to meet you. Thank you very much for coming in to us. Um, you're in the biscuit trade. You must have a favourite. I've worked in the biscuit industry for nearly 30 years. Um, my favourite biscuit is an East Coast Bakehouse ah, chunk, cool. chunk cookie. It is incredible. Is that your, is that your flagship made, product these days? The best-selling product made with real Irish butter, Irish oats. Uh, it's fantastic. Are people's tastes in biscuits changing in general? The big selling biscuits remain exactly the same as they were 100 years ago. Um, uh, there's lots of innovation around the sides, lots of new things happening. Uh, there's better nutritional offers, there's more indulgent products, but the, the core products remain the same. Uh, they just keep improving. But you were saying as well, I mean, you've been in the biscuit trade for a long time, you used to work at uh, Jacobs and, and, and Fox's as well in the UK, is that right? What about those staples like digestives and rich teas and things like yep. that? I mean, still are they, selling. Are they still as popular as ever? Absolutely. The biscuit market is flat. It's uh, uh, every year, um, over the last couple of decades, it's gone either up 1% or down 1%. Uh, Biscuits are really part of everyday life. Uh, consumers in Ireland and Britain particularly uh, eat biscuits as part of their daily routine and, um, uh, and that has, hasn't changed. You were the, the kind of the steward of the old Irish icons for a while, the, 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 the Kimberleys, Macados and Coconut Creams. Are our kind of tastes for them remaining the same as far as you know? Or? Yeah, I used to, uh, I worked in, uh, at Jacobs on two occasions. Uh, the first time I was there as a marketing director uh, and then I bought the business. Uh, I came back and bought the business in 2004. Uh, those great old Irish brands are still there. They're still performing well. Um, uh, they're, they're great products, part of our childhood. They're part of our memories. And, uh, and families, parents still provide them to their children. Um, uh, yeah, they will be there forever. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Special place in all our hearts. But now you've got a new brand, uh, East Coast Bakehouse, up and running, doing well? We've been planning this project for about four years. Uh, we got it up and running exactly two years ago, uh, on the same month that Britain decided to leave the European Union. And our plan was to establish the largest biscuit production unit, uh, largest biscuit production line in Europe, uh, which we've done. Uh, and our plan was to export about 80% of the output to the UK market. Uh, so we've had to change dramatically. So the last two years have been really traumatic. Uh, through a startup, uh, through a very um, intense uh, period of growing a new business. Uh, we have had to change. We've had to pivot. Uh, we've, uh, so the UK market is now not as important in our plans. It's still there, but it's not as important as it would have been. Uh, we're now trading in 20 countries. Uh, we now have a much stronger presence here in Ireland, uh, where, where retailers are particularly concerned about Brexit. Uh, and giving us a greater opportunity to provide local product here in the in the Irish market. It seems it's always been your dream to have an Irish biscuit factory. Why why is it uh, so important um, to you? Creating a, a new uh, food manufacturing business of scale uh, as a sort of a startup is uh, a pretty unusual step. Uh, very few uh, individuals have uh, tried to do it. Very few teams of people have tried to start at scale. Um, for me, uh, the, the fact that in the Irish market, uh, there's five million euros worth of biscuits imported into Ireland every week, uh, consumed every week, put on the shelves biscuits. of biscuits, imported biscuits, mainly from the UK. Um, uh, East Coast Bakehouse is the only um, uh, producer of biscuits here on the island of scale. There's a lot of small artisan biscuit companies around the country who do really beautiful products, fantastic products, but they can't compete. They're not, they're not uh, a manufacturing facility of scale, and you have to be to compete. So we've laid down the most, uh, the largest individual biscuit production line in Europe, uh, and we're making great progress. We'll do about uh, eight million euro of turnover this year. Uh, the plant has the capacity to produce about thirty million. Uh, so we're going through a very rapid growth, and we we believe that'll be full probably in about three years. 
were you in any way nervous though, I suppose, setting that up? Because of course, you know, you've had a, a biscuit factory here in the past, the Jacobs factory, which unfortunately you had to close. Mm-hmm. And, and I wonder what's different this time around. Yeah, a lot of biscuit manufacturing has been around in old uh, factories with a lot of legacy costs associated with them. And the older ones, like unfortunately, like the old Jacobs factory, uh, had uh, very significant legacy costs. Uh, that made them uncompetitive and there was less and less being produced in that plant because it couldn't compete. Uh, More and more was being imported from uh, more efficient plants. Uh, So having a a new facility, well invested with the very best equipment, uh, the most efficient processes, uh, a great team of people working on it, uh, is is like the new life of biscuit manufacturing in Ireland. And, um, uh, And Yes, we were cautious about it and we were concerned of the risks associated with starting a business of this scale. Uh, the total investment in this business is 20 million euro. Uh, so it's a big bet. It's a, it's a large bet on, a, on an opportunity which we have no doubt exists. Uh, and, and we believe we'll get a good payback on that. Listen, you've got a lot of strings to your story uh, and we'll, I want to get through them all. But let's go back to the very beginning, I suppose, and your uh, you know, journey into the, the food business. Um, you started out kind of... Uh, the, the, well, there was business in your blood, wasn't there? I grew up in a uh, in Cabra on the north side of Dublin. Uh, my parents had a newsagent shop, and we lived in the rooms above the newsagent shop. So we, we grew up in a business, literally in a business. So every day there was conversations about uh, about business. Every breakfast time, there was a chat about who was supplying stuff, who which which delivery man was due to arrive, and we had to open the back gate to let something in, or uh, we had to open up the shop to let the first customers come in and buy their newspapers. Um, uh, so. Every day, every meal, there was debates about business and discussions about cash flows and banks. And uh, for a, a a little shop that literally had the family running it and a couple of, of local staff who who who, um, who worked from time to time. Can you think of any so, lessons you learned in that time that you still see kind of playing out in your your life today? I think everything to do with business that I know was based on that foundation of uh, understanding how to deal with customers, uh, engaging with. Um, uh, with local customers who came and, and knew my father's name, my mother's name, and would chat to them. and would, it, was, it was like a local pub almost. It was, it was a news agent shop. But it was a, a place where people came in to chat and engage. And that engagement with customers at whatever level, uh, be it a brand, be it a, a, a small local shop, that engagement with customers is crucial to building a business. Um, so that foundation was laid. I think the management of cash, management of, of uh, the basic management of business, um, uh, the ability to interact with people, be it suppliers or um, our, uh, our customers, uh, all of those things were learned from just growing up in that environment. Mm. So you didn't go straight into business for yourself. You uh, spent a, a, a serious period of time working in kind of w- with, with household brands. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I left college. I went to college, uh, went to UCD, studied business, uh, commerce and, uh, and a master's in marketing and then left and went into the food industry. And I've been in the food industry now for 35 years. Frightening thought. Um, uh, and the first half of that time was working for multinational food companies. So I, I worked for Bachelors, for Foxes, um, Biscuits in the UK, uh, for uh, Evian and Volvic, um, as Managing Director of Evian and Volvic for the UK, as Jacobs, uh, Marketing Director here in, in Dublin. Um, and ultimately as uh, Managing Director of Kellogg's for the UK and Ireland, uh, based in their European head office at the time in uh, Manchester. And did you always think that someday you'd strike out and do something by yourself? It was a, a dream that uh, I always had, the idea of owning a business, of, of uh, following in the footsteps of my parents, perhaps in, a, uh, in, in that context of, of having the, the control over my own future, having the freedom to create something of value. Um, it was something that I really wanted to achieve. Uh, as I progressed further and further in my career working for uh, large food companies, it was probably becoming less and less of a likely uh, outcome. Um, the, the risk became higher. The risk became the idea of leaving the comfort of the corporate life. Um, being managing director of Kellogg's for the UK and Ireland is a, a very well-paid job with lots of, lots of benefits, lots of comforts. And a, and a huge structure uh, around uh, um, uh, me as an individual doing that job. And the idea of moving from that environment into a startup uh, is a sort of frightening transition. 
Really and yes, you did it. <laughs> I did it, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was very fortunate. I, Why um, did you do it? Why did you I, take the risk? I actually didn't make the decision. I was fired by Kellogg's. I, I was... Um, I didn't fit in with the Kellogg way of doing things. I was uh, employed from, uh, I, uh, prior to that, I was managing director of Fox's Biscuits and they recruited me in as managing director of Kellogg's. Um, most of the senior managers in Kellogg's are developed through the organization and they, they, they build up uh, their careers in that culture. Uh, and I was coming from outside. And I found the culture of Kellogg's to be um, uh, constraining. Uh, I, uh, I had a sense of powerlessness in a, in a senior position because of the multinational nature of it and the matrix structures that are in place for, for businesses of that scale. And I'd come from a business where I was running as managing director of Foxes. I was being allowed, to, it was still part of a multinational, but I was allowed to run that business as if it was my own. So that transition I found very hard and I didn't fit in. And to be fair to Kellogg's, they are one of the most successful food companies in the world. Their system works. It's a, it's a great process, they have really strong processes and systems. Um, but the 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 culture for me wasn't what I was used to, just wasn't and I match. really struggled. And they recruited me in. It was a a a bad appointment from their point of view, <laughs> most importantly, but also from my point of view, it was a it was a a, a misstep in a career. You used that um, word fired. Um, when a lot of people leave a company for that very very mm. reason, there's generally this kind of soft speak around it, like you know, parted by mutual agreement or something like that. You're obviously not a believer in, in that. Um, you call it as as you see it. No, it was uh, it wasn't by mutual agreement. <laughs> I was uh, sitting in my uh, the the gentleman I reported to, the European president, and he just highlighted the fact that he didn't feel this was working, and we best if we finished. And could I be out of the building by midday? Gosh. Um, so I was fired, um, and. Again, to be fair to Kellogg's, as I said, they have great processes, they have great systems, and they have a great way of firing senior executives. And they're, they handled it incredibly professionally. They managed the process. I learned a huge amount about how they, how they handled that process. Uh, and they were very generous. And I suppose the one piece of advice I can sort of sit here and give today in, in that period of my life, if anybody ever gets fired by anyone in their career, get fired by Kellogg's. They're a fantastic <laughs> business to get fired by. They're really generous. And they gave me a, a financial payment uh, that provided us with the, um, the springboard to uh, allow me to go into the, For the, next chapter. the second phase of, yeah. uh, of actually owning businesses and, uh, and moving on from there. But listen, what was going through your mind at the time? Was it, was it terror or was it relief? Uh, no, total shock and... Uh, a uh, huge disappointment and uh, a, a sense of um, a loss of role uh, when, when, when you're fired in a business or you lose your job, there's a sense of being derolled. And I'd come from, from being in that position of being in the managing director of, of a, a very large organization and walking into the building with a, a certain status, I suppose. And uh, I had convinced myself that I, was, uh, I had, uh, had that status justifiably. And then to be suddenly told, actually, you don't, you're gone mm. and uh, out you go. Um, uh, there, there is a, no, it was a horrible experience. Uh, um, but we came back. My um, myself and my wife, Alison, Alison Kauser. Uh, we had just had our first child, Shona. Uh, we uh, decided to return to Dublin. Uh, we came back to Dublin, and we set about literally within the next week or two, we set about establishing our, our first business, and we called it Shona Foods after our daughter. <laughs> not, not usually creative. Um, and Shona Foods became the platform to uh, acquire other food businesses, and uh, we went on to build up uh, our, our first business. So when you were kind of released from the, the, the reins that were put upon you, not just by Kellogg's, but I guess by other uh, you know, big companies that you worked for and all their rules and processes, what did, you, what did you know you wanted to do differently when you were doing it for yourself? The, the obsession that I think food companies need to have, and not every food company has, and actually very few food companies have, is an obsession with food and getting the food right, getting the offering of uh, the, the quality of the food, the taste of the food, the nutrition of the food. Getting those elements right should be the most basic um, requirement for a food business. But it's extraordinary. Very few food companies, and, and particularly the big ones, uh, really don't take care of their food. Um, so there's a process of, of re-engineering of food products to get costs down. Uh, there's a huge pressure on food manufacturers to sell products cheaply. Uh, consumers expect cheap products. Retailers push down the prices, of co uh, the costs of products. Uh, the the response from food manufacturing generally 
is to shave the quality of the food, uh, bring down the costs. Uh, and that's happened in every category. It's happened right across the, the board, in, particularly in, in biscuits. And I think that's why we've been presented with a, an opportunity to actually present biscuits that are, are made well with good ingredients, made efficiently, but using really good ingredients. And, and that process of, of shaving bits of quality off product is very easy to, to convince yourself that it's okay. Um, there's a concept of a sort of salami effect. If you take one slice off a salami and you ask a consumer and show them before and after, it's the same salami. Nobody knows the difference. There's no difference in length. You take another slice, still nobody knows the difference. So each slice can be, um, you can convince yourself that the quality of the food is, is exactly the same as it was before. Eventually the salami is shorter. Uh, and, and food companies are going through that salami slicing process. Can you give and, me any, uh, any kind of examples though of, of, of actual instances where you yeah. were kind of expected mm-hmm. to to cut out the more expensive and the better quality <clears throat> ingredients? Practically every food company, every multinational food company goes through a process of, of reducing their costs. Um, the highest profile one recently, just last year, uh, was uh, Toblerone, part of the Mondelez uh, group, uh, where to hit a price point, they increase the gap between the peaks of the uh, of the Toblerone but, to, to get the cost of the product down yeah. to sell that That's product making it smaller though but I just wonder about the ingredients that go into the actual product. Are you yeah. talking about kind of throwing in more, in more bad things like E-numbers, preservatives and, Unfortunately, and sugar? Yes. Unfortunately yes. It's a in biscuits uh, almost every biscuit now is manufactured using uh, palm oil uh, as the fat in the within the biscuit uh, product. In, in East Coast Bakehouse we're using butter. Um, um, so using a, a natural, a natural pure Irish butter ingredient as the base, and, and if you go back twenty, thirty years, lots of companies were using yeah. butter. Yeah, and palm um, oil is, is something that it, lots of people are talking about and are worried about. And it's a, it's a fraction of the cost of butter. Yeah. So that's the reason for doing it. it. To try and minimize the impact, so leaving aside the taste and the quality issue, to minimize the environmental impact, a lot of companies are insisting on sustainable palm oil and, and finding ways to to. To avoid it having horrific uh, environmental problems, um, uh, in terms of how it's sourced and the impact it has on uh, on the environment, um, um, but from a cost point of view, it's a it's, it's just one example. Everything else same. The thickness of chocolate on a on a digestive biscuit is not the same as it was ten or twenty years ago. Mm. Um, um, every every category is the same. You bring up chocolate digestives there again. Um, one of your bigger leaps was acquiring Jacobs, the the makers of those those are kind of iconic Irish biscuits. Tell tell me about how that ended up under your ownership and 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 you know what your plans were to to reshape the company. Yeah, we um, I, I said we had created a a foundation business called Shona Foods. We used that as a platform to acquire uh, food businesses, and the first one we acquired was uh, Fruitfield Foods from Nestle. Uh, the international group were selling uh, one of their Irish businesses, uh, which included fruit fields, jams and marmalades, chef sauces, uh, silvermints and some other brands. So we bought that business in um, 2002. Uh, we used the Kellogg's check as our equity investment. Uh, we got together with a couple of other colleagues, um, an organization called uh, Lion Court Capital, David Andrews and Michael Tunney, uh, also invested. And so between us, we put in a million euro. Uh, as an investment. Um, uh, we held uh, 60% and David and Michael held 20% each. And we we used that platform to acquire uh, Fruitfield from Nestle, which was funded by that equity plus uh, mainly bank debt. Um, it was July 2002, uh, it was just a couple of days before my 40th birthday. Um, and uh, we acquired that business. It was a loss-making business. It was a uh, it was turning over about 25 million euro, losing about 2 million euro. And we put a management team in place. We managed that business, gave it some focus, gave it some attention. And within a year, it was profitable. And by 2004, we were in a position to use that as a platform to acquire another business. And Jacobs came up for sale. Group Danone, the French food group where I used to work, um, had uh, decided to sell their, their biscuit businesses. And they put the, the Jacobs business on the market. And we entered a process. We... Uh, acquired that business uh, in uh, the uh, end of 2004. And we brought those businesses together to create a group which we called the Jacob Fruitfield Food Group. 
um, and continue to build a management team um, uh, and continue to run that business for about uh, eight or ten years. Um, uh, going through some, as, as we said earlier, going through some changes, uh, going through some uh, uh, adjustments and, and building brands, changing the way things were done, trying to make the business more efficient uh, uh, until we got to a point where the business had uh, a reasonable level of profitability and it was stable and was uh, turning over when we sold the business it was turning over about 100 million euro but i mean sadly i suppose for that period people will off mostly probably remember it those outside the company for, for the closure the the, mm. the biscuit factory in in, in Tala. Uh, tell me what you know what went wrong there you know you, you must have had a, a plan to you know put the business on an even keel and why didn't it work out? Yeah, it was a difficult, a really difficult time. Uh, it was difficult for for the people involved who were working in the in the, uh, in the uh, factory, and difficult for ourselves. Like everybody going through the process, uh, was nobody was enjoying it. It was a manufacturing facility that was hugely underutilized. It was a very old factory. Some of the machinery was 70, 80 years old. Uh, it was completely uncompetitive. It was uh, it was losing contracts. Uh, it was producing about 8,000 tonnes of biscuits. Uh, the plant we've set up in Drogheda uh, can produce 20,000 tonnes of biscuits. So the, the output from that plant, a very large uh, building, but the output was almost gone to nothing. And uh, it had very high costs and uh, it just couldn't compete. Uh, so to, to get the business to a point where it was financially uh, stable, we had to go through changes. And, and unfortunately, part of that change was uh, uh, the closure of the manufacturing facility. I think we, we acted in a way which was um, uh, fair. Uh, we treated people well. Uh, there was no industrial actions as part of the process. There was a agreement with the unions. We paid uh, seven times, uh, seven a weeks per year of service uh, uh, to in redundancy payments. The legislation requires two weeks. Um, uh, individuals left with, with settlements. That some of them were very happy to retire early. Um, some were fairly transitory and we're going to probably leave anyway and, and but they got a payment to leave but there were a group who were very badly affected by it and uh, and it's probably my greatest uh, the most difficult period uh, and and a period when uh, uh, it wasn't it wasn't positive for anybody it was it was difficult for some people in that in that business but we did everything we could to make it uh, it gave as much notice as possible I think it was a year's notice to help uh, people take on the implications of that change um, and we managed it uh, as well as I think could be done. But did, it, did it make you question, I suppose, the economics of actually doing manufacturing in Ireland? Because you no. know, when the factory closed, yeah. you moved production overseas. Mm-hmm. No, uh, it, that manufacturing facility was, uh, was uh, uncompetitive. It doesn't make manufacturing uncompetitive in Ireland. There's a huge opportunity in Ireland for manufacturing of food products. The level of imports of consumer food packaged products into Ireland is obscene. Uh, in every category, uh, in biscuits, 99% of all the products sold on supermarket shelves are imported. Uh, same applies to uh, categories like yogurt, a huge proportion of yogurts imported. Um, uh, confectionery, massive proportion of confectionery is imported. There's, there's loads of opportunities. If a manufacturing facility can be established that's efficient, that's well invested, uh, that can put the, can raise the financing to make it work and do it right, uh, manufacturing in Ireland has a fantastic future. You had built up Jacob Fruitfield as your kind of really your first major enterprise of your own, uh, and then you sold up uh, in what year was it? 20, 2012 when you sold it up? 2011. 2011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, why did you make that decision? We were building uh, Jacob Fruitfield into a, a substantial business, 100 million turnover, um, a really good uh, portfolio of brands, and we felt that the future of those brands was probably in. in uh, had a better future if it was part of a larger organization that it, it could work in tandem with with other brands and other structures uh, so our options were to continue to build or to step back from it and see if if it could be built as part in partnership with somebody else um, uh, we were approached by a group called valio foods uh, who had just recently acquired bachelors and um, shamrock and some other brands and they were keen to take the Jacob Fruitfield brands into their uh, into their uh, portfolio. Uh, so a deal was done where we sold the business to Valio, 
uh, our management team, uh, led by Seamus Carney, who was our managing director working for us in, in Jacob Fruitfield, became the chief executive of the Valio Food Group as part of that process. And he continues to be in that role, uh, building the Valio Food Group into probably one of the most successful Irish food companies um, in terms of rapid pace of growth, heading towards 800, 900 million turnover. Uh, currently, uh, with an outstanding management team led by by Seamus Carney, and is that because it's, um, it's basically got a lot of Irish brands, kind of iconic Irish brands? Yeah, they're more brought into the same family and under one roof. The type of brands that aren't sold overseas. Yeah, they're more than that. So yes, they do that, and they do that exceptionally well. Uh, but they also have acquired businesses in the UK and acquired businesses in Italy. Uh, so they're a big company now. They're a large, really strong uh, food company coming from nothing, and they've built that up. Uh, the main shareholder is. Uh, uh, Catfest, a private equity firm, um, and as part of that process, when we sold the business to them, we um, uh, took about half of the equity off in cash, and we reinvested the other half back into the Valio Food Group. So for up until very recently, I continued to be a shareholder in the Valio Food Group and and watched uh, with huge admiration of how they continue to build those brands and uh, and create more value in that uh, for that investment. You also, though, probably walked away with quite a sizable wad of cash in your back pocket. How much were we talking um, about? And yes, it was a. Uh, it hasn't it hasn't been public, but it was uh, well in excess of a hundred times the investment we made in our original business. Okay. Um, so financially, it was a, it was a great outcome. Uh, it uh, it changed our lives. Myself and Alison uh, have sort of moved on to a sort of a new phase, in in our careers of uh, becoming investors in startups and and doing other things that we want to do outside business um, you could have headed off and put your feet up and sip cocktails on the beach that uh, doesn't seem to be in your dna financially yes there was no um uh, we don't have financial concerns of that type um but you have to do something it's mm-hmm. um uh, a, i'm i'm now 55 uh, back then i was uh, early 50s and uh, and it's a long way to go. It's an awful, an awful lot of games of golf to fill your days <laughs> until you can't. Uh, you not work on that. Until you can't camp. walk anymore. <laughs> um, uh, so no, you have to do something, and and doing things that we do now are are. Uh, it's, we're incredibly lucky. We're incredibly fortunate to be in a position where financially we can perhaps take some risks, uh, take uh, go into areas that we wouldn't normally do, and do things that have nothing to do with financial return, and and uh, use our time in ways that we want to. And, and you have done that. You've put your money into other food companies and, and also into a, a kind of a social project in, in Haiti. Is that right? Yeah. We, um, when we sold uh, Jacob Fruitfield, as I say, we rolled some of the equity into Valio, but we also set up a business called The Company of Food, uh, which is a platform for investments in food companies. So mostly investing our own funds, but also in, in tandem with other investors uh, looking for opportunities in food. Uh, food and drink. So we've done uh, about half a dozen food investments. Um, uh, mostly, uh, they they seem to be working. Uh, one we invested in and we've exited and got a return on it. We're quite happy. Um, uh, one has failed completely and uh, we uh, will never see the cash again. Uh, actually, two two have failed. Uh, the others look promising and continue to, and we continue to support them. We found it a little frustrating. Uh, uh, our attempts to find opportunities of scale to invest in the food category were uh, was slow. Uh, there isn't a huge deal flow of food opportunities in, in Ireland. Um, we want to be in Ireland. We stayed in Ireland. We pay our taxes in Ireland. Uh, when we sold the business, we didn't go overseas despite all of the advice that we get from the great financial institutions. Uh, we stayed here and we paid our taxes and we will stay here and pay our taxes. It's not a... Uh, we have no interest in uh, in uh, changing our lifestyles for the sake of, of a small financial gain of that type. Um, uh, the, the staying here and looking for opportunities in Ireland does limit the, the flow of deals, which is a real problem. Uh, so, and Does it have to be that way? Is it just the nature of the fact that the, the market is relatively small? Or is there something else hindering yeah, I think, that kind of enterprise? I think there just aren't enough uh, food businesses uh, in existence that are going through transition that need investment that that perhaps want to exit or or want to take their businesses onto the next scale and need and need financial support and and operational support um it's just the market is small and the numbers involved are small so there's probably only one or two food transactions corporate transactions of any scale done each year in ireland 
Uh, and so we've been looking out for those, f frustratingly trying to find opportunities where we found many food startups are lifestyle businesses. We found a lot of individuals who have great businesses and great brands. But when they consider the implication of taking the business on to the next stage, of the implications of bringing in more finance, the implications of perhaps having to put a board together or taking somebody who will distract them from what they want to do themselves and uh, um, having to make choices perhaps they wouldn't make if it was just their own business, uh, having to deal with multiple retailers or food service groups. Uh, those sort of transitions and those changes are things that a lot of people, when they realize the implications of growth, a lot of individuals who started food companies don't really want to go down that I road. I assume they want to, to stay small. They want to stay small. They're lifestyle business, and they're probably right. They're, for many individuals, they've got small businesses making a good living out of it. Uh, why would they want to deal with Why bring on the headaches? With the retailers or the banks or the uh, or, uh, board of directors. Or, um, so for many people, they don't want to make that choice when they realize the implications of, uh, of growth. And is that why um, you've ended up doing it again for yourselves, yeah. kind of starting yeah. with a clean sheet and yeah. launching East Coast Bakehouse? Yeah, we've started a couple of businesses, uh, um, not backing other people, but uh, initiating them ourselves and putting management teams together uh, as part of our, our uh, initiative. And East Coast Bakehouse is the most significant of those. Uh, a total of 20 million euro has been invested. Uh, it's been supported hugely by Enterprise Ireland. Uh, they've been fantastic. Uh, the Enterprise Ireland offerings for startups is uh, really, without any exaggeration, this project would not have happened without the, both the financial support and the advice from Enterprise Ireland. Um, the support from Board Bia. I've been involved in Board Bia for many years. I was formerly the chairman up until recently. Uh, but the, the support and advice from Board Bia is outstanding. As a food industry, we're incredibly fortunate to have the state bodies involved in supporting startups. And, and what about kind of uh, other investors, be they uh, you know, e equity investors or be they, be they the banks? I mean, what about, for example, the, the, the colleagues you met down through the years through the, the EY Entrepreneur of the Year network? Yeah, we, um, uh, in, in establishing this business, East Coast Bakehouse, we uh, have three sources of funding, uh, equity, um, both our own personal equity, but also we brought in third party investors. Um, we sold 30% of the equity uh, of the business plan before a brick was put on the ground. Um, we, we raised three and a half million euro uh, from about 10 or 12 investors. Uh, a number of them are former EY Entrepreneur of the Year finalists. Uh, one of them uh, actually sits on our board. Um, uh, the, the, um, uh, a number of them are ex-food industry uh, individuals who've uh, sold food businesses and have come on board as, uh, as investors. But do, um, you, do you get a business like that off the ground without just classic credit? Bank, bank debt is part of the, the structure and part necessary structure. There has to be some debt financing to make the numbers work. Uh, so the equity, the three pieces of source of funding were equity, uh, Enterprise Ireland funding and bank debt. And the bank debt piece was the most difficult. It was uh, trying to get that over the line in time for the project to progress. Um, uh, at a startup phase, all the plates need to spin at the same time. Uh, you have to get the deal done, you have to get the property, you have to get the, the management team together, and you have to get all the elements of finance all together at the same time. And getting all those plates to spin together is probably the most difficult, uh, the greatest hurdle a startup of scale has to go through. And in terms of funding, the most frustrating part of those three parts were uh, the bank debt. Uh, we did get bank funding. Uh, we have great support from uh, Ulster Bank, uh, who in reality were the only bank that were willing to uh, consider uh, an investment in a startup. And most banks, and all, almost all banks, uh, struggle with the concept of uh, bank debt being provided for startups where there's no, there's no cash flow to fund, there's probably no property of any, any equity value in the property beyond uh, the purchase price. Uh, there, there's nothing to fund in a startup other than the belief in the management team, the belief in the plan. And, and the products that banks have on offer really don't meet the needs of startups. Um, the advertising slogans that the banks run uh, don't really find their way into reality. Um, it's not an original line, but the, the guy who, who writes the bank's ads is not the same guy who lends the money. It's, a really, it's really, really difficult for startups to get banks to support them. And, and probably, to, to be fair to the banks, probably rightly so, because the banks are, they don't have the products available for startups. But is that, is, is that a problem that startup entrepreneurs in other countries experience? 
Not as much. I think the, the pain that the banks in Ireland have gone through and the people who work in the banks have gone through have put them in a position where they find making those decisions, taking that risk, uh, probably unnecessary. Now, why would they want to put themselves in that position? Why would a bank want to take a risk with a startup? And I think when you talk to the senior management in banks, they very openly say startups are, are probably more appropriate for equity funding or for for private equity uh, organizations or for, for other sources of funding. But but standard banks struggle with startups. So when you think about that risk aversion uh, among the banks and you think about what happened whenever you um, set the ball rolling on East Coast Bakehouse and put the production line into action, you could hardly blame them because that was Brexit week. Yeah. Yeah, it was a uh, when we woke up that morning and saw the uh, saw the result. Uh, it was a bit of a shock. Uh, we had a plan which said eighty percent of our products was going to go into the UK, almost all as retail private label. But we discovered very quickly that the retailers in the UK, uh, from uh, the the first the first change was the currency issue had moved, so we suddenly became uncompetitive. Uh, we were struggling to get the price points that we needed to reach to uh, to to get the contracts. But also the retailers in the UK were looking at what was happening with Brexit and they were already sourcing within Britain uh, and we were asking them to change their sourcing and go outside Britain. And with the uncertainty and the the risks associated with what might happen uh, on Brexit, UK retailers were hesitating. And um, uh, that has been a struggle. We've we've made some progress more recently on it, but it has was a struggle and really slowed us down. How um, how perilous did it feel at the time? I mean, suddenly all your well laid plans had been utterly cast us under. Yeah, yeah. We had to find other opportunities very quickly. Um, we had to do things that we, in our business plan, uh, we had intended to go beyond the UK uh, in year three, year four of our of our business development program. Uh, we had to pull all that forward. Uh, we had to look at the opportunities m- much more aggressively in the domestic Irish market, where we could see that the opportunity here, if there is a hard Brexit, the opportunity here in Ireland is massive. We're the only manufacturer of biscuits of scale. Five million euros of biscuits are being imported into Ireland every week. Uh, the retailers who are buying their retail private label are buying their brands, mainly in the UK, uh, may be hit with, with tariffs or at least difficulty in trading, uh, possibly. If that were to happen, sourcing locally is a huge opportunity. So does that um, seem for you that the, the, the worst of Brexit is out of the way? There was the initial shock and you had to change your plans, but you, you say you're now treating the prospect of hard Brexit as as an opportunity? We have huge opportunities that have been thrown up by Brexit. So we're, the domestic market is one. All of the Irish retailers are hugely aware of the risks of associated with Brexit and they want to mitigate those risks. And no, no retailer wants to be the one left behind importing biscuits when when everybody else is sourcing some products, at least locally. Um, so the opportunities in Ireland uh, and working with the Irish retailers who've massively supported us in, in getting going with our business. We have listings in every major supermarket. Uh, we have There's a recognition of the, a uh, really positive recognition of the need to source locally. Um, so in the domestic market, uh, there's a big opportunity. And the fact that we've been forced to look beyond the UK for export uh, markets has put us in a much stronger position. Uh, we're, we're trading now in 20 countries. Uh, we have found routes and, and access to agents in uh, working through a, uh, a number of uh, structures that have were opportunities we never would have considered, we never would have thought of. Uh, we didn't even know we needed to do it if Brexit hadn't happened. So we're, we're probably in a much stronger position than we would have been if I, I, Brexit hadn't been decided. Are you in any way concerned, though, about the, the wider Irish economy and how it would fare in the event of a, of a hard Brexit? Yeah, yeah, hugely. For the, for the food industry in total, uh, the UK is 37% of all Irish exports, uh, 50% of all beef exports, uh, 80% of, cheese, of cheddar cheese into the UK. Uh, for for businesses in those categories, uh, it's a massive problem. It's a huge problem. The, the Irish food industry is, it's probably the biggest challenge for the food industry. Um, so, h- how do you think? You know, what's your view of the, the the movements, the strategies that have been put into place now to insulate those uh, exporters in the event of that hard Brexit? Because I mean, obviously, you, you've got your eye across the whole industry, working, having worked with with with, with Board B and the mm-hmm. like. Yeah, I think firstly. Uh, the first point I'd make is it's the company's responsibility to solve their problems. So government won't solve their problems. So individual companies are 
becoming much more prepared for the implications of Brexit. And uh, uh, lots of companies, East Coast Bakehouse is not unique. Lots of companies are going down the route of, of finding ways to, to address their business model uh, to get through the Brexit challenge. Um, and it's more difficult for some than others. Um, the dependency on the UK market is, is enormous for some companies and, and they're really struggling and, and the pressure and they need support uh, to get through that. But primarily it's the companies that need to do it and the companies are doing it. I think in terms of government support, uh, there's a, a huge resource. We're, we're incredibly fortunate as a food industry in Ireland to have the state agencies of Bordbea, uh, Enterprise Ireland, Chagas and the other agencies that are working to support the Irish food industry. Other food companies internationally look at what happens in Ireland in awe at the ability of, a, of an industry to work together. The ecosystem in the Irish food industry is incredibly strong. Companies help one another. Uh, there's a sense of a phrase that's used in the food industry of coopetition. Uh, competitors cooperating, helping one another to to introduce to customers to non-competing, obviously in, in a non-competing way, uh, but helping working together to help one another. Uh, and everybody knows everyone. It's a very small industry, uh, and it's it's a sector which has grown right through the recession. Every year for the past six or seven years, there's been growth in exports. And, and that growth will continue. Uh, th- Irish food exports will probably double in the next five or six years. You talk, though, about you know, it being companies' responsibility to, to insulate themselves. Government obviously has a role as well. And I'm thinking of one of the other hats that you wear, as I think you're the, 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 the chair of the, the housing agency. Isn't that right? And so many companies out there right now are saying that the, the property crisis is one of their you know, clearest and most present dangers. We've seen, you know, lots of people wondering about whether financial services companies will come to, to Dublin in the event of, of, of a hard Brexit. And lots of those saying, actually, it's just too expensive to live in Dublin. Yeah. Yeah, I've been asked. I finished my role as chair of Board Bia about six weeks ago, and I've been asked to take up the chair of the housing agency. Um, uh, so I come to this challenge not from the, the housing sector. Um, on a positive, from a positive perspective, I come with no baggage. So none of the stakeholders in any way uh, have any, have any engagement with. So, so I can apply the approaches that have proved to be successful in other organisations, either in their own private businesses or in Board Bia, uh, in a way to maximise the performance of the board of uh, of the housing agency, um, and and the organisation itself. So I'm coming to that, and I'm new to it. I'm into it about a month. The first what, thing what do you make of what you've seen so far in terms of the, yeah. the actual efforts to, to, to make a difference? Well, the first thing that strikes me is that there is a problem at almost every level of the housing sector, um, from how rough sleepers issue is managed to hostels to emergency accommodation, uh, right through to social housing and the supply of social housing to rental uh, costs. Um, to mortgage arrears, uh, all the way through, right up to the problems that are affected by companies attempting to recruit new staff and and provide housing solutions for them. Um, so right across our society, not just our economy, but right across our society, housing is a massive issue. And, and all of those issues are interlinked. And there are efforts to solve, and there, are, there has been progress, to solve elements of those problems. Sometimes fixing one problem has a knock-on effect on other problems. Has, um, has it been ambitious enough, though? Because, you know, you talk about all the different strands of the problems in the housing sector right now, and they all effectively come down to supply, and there mm-hmm. aren't enough homes out there for the people that need them. And when a, a market is broken, it takes somebody and, you know, the government to intervene. And why isn't the government moving in to, to stimulate more units? You know, there's no new... Cabras or uh, Inchicores being built like there were in the th- at the time of the last housing crisis after yeah. after the, mm-hmm. the Second World yeah. War. There's a an incredible number of people uh, attempting to solve this problem, and everybody has a view on what the solution is. I've met in the last month or six weeks since I've agreed to take this role. The number of conversations I've had with people who've come to me and said, "What you should do is what <laughs> the solution is, and there are elements of the solution." Um, it's not a lack of uh, effort. It's not a lack of intention. I think it's the issue that the, the it's the biggest issue facing society in Ireland today. I think it's a there's a, an obsession 
uh, to find ways of solving it at every level, be it government level. I've no party political links. I've no interest in defending any any efforts and uh, or, or any any from a party point of view. That's irrelevant. The 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 level of interest and determination and the quality and and work rate that people are going through is fantastic, but the progress has not been achieved and the level of frustration is incredibly high. So people who are working very hard, people in the housing agency, a great team of people, there's 60 people working there who are working on initiatives and programs and elements of the solution to try and move things along, uh, have a sense of frustration that the progress isn't being made. So clearly, I think every actor in the process needs to up their game, be it uh, the charities, be it the, the housing agency, be it the department, be it the, the approved housing bodies. Everybody needs to up their game and get and get more more houses supplied as part of the solution, structures that work in terms of affordability, a uh, supply of social housing. Uh, social housing is a big part of the solution and, and it will be a big part of the solution. And, and things are beginning to move. The, the outputs are beginning to creep up. There's new numbers being, uh, uh, being announced this week uh, about the 20,000 or so new new um, properties that were built last year. Uh, but we need probably we need 35 more. or 40,000 yeah. uh, houses each year. Well, w- we wish you the best of luck with um, with that role. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your home life because you work with your wife and you've got two little girls at sure. home. Uh, how does that work, working alongside your, 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 your better half, no doubt, and having the girls um, uh, getting enough time with them as well? Uh, beyond any question, um, any business success I've had, any um, any progress I've made in any of the public service stuff that we've done or the charity work we do in, in Haiti or Africa, uh, without any exception, my proudest uh, achievement is the success of our family. Uh, as a family, uh, we have a, an incredible, fortunate life. Uh, my wife is Alison Kauser. She's known to probably some of your listeners and viewers uh, as one of the dragons on Dragon's Den. Um, uh, it was announced a couple of years ago when she took up that role that she was uh, to be appointed as one of the uh, the investors on Dragon's Den and I tweeted uh, I was very proud of my tweet um, uh, I've been married to a dragon for 20 years and now at last the rest of the world knows <laughs> and she sort of laughed and she's forgiven me now and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> she's got over that uh, that challenge um, uh, but Alison has uh, had great success in her investments uh, and in our investments we work together on on a lot of the projects and, and she's a co-founder of East Coast Bakehouse and we've worked together. We share an office. Uh, we have an office on uh, uh, Fitzwilliam Place here in Dublin. Uh, we, uh, we work together. Thankfully, we manage to close off at times when we want to, uh, when we, we sort of shut up shop and, uh, and turn back to family life. Uh, we have two girls, uh, not so little anymore. Our um, eldest girl is 17. Oh. And uh, our uh, Shona and our youngest girl, Tara, is almost 14. Um, so they're growing up into fantastic uh, uh, ladies who are uh, really well adjusted and uh, I'm very proud of them. And, and do they have aspirations to, to work in, in, in your world? And I wonder what advice you would give to them if they were to kind of start with a, a blank piece of paper like, like you've uh, done with, with, yeah. with your latest enterprise. I think um, they, are, they have an interest in business. They've seen businesses being developed and we... The talk about it as as I was growing up we're doing the same thing in our family uh, I don't know if they'll end up in business I've, I've no idea um, they they have much wider interests they're um, uh, very taken by uh, Alison is the chair of uh, women for election uh, the body that uh, encourages um, uh, female candidates to run for elections of various types and trains them to uh, run for election uh, so that conversation also happens a lot in the uh, in the house um, so I think they need to have the choices, they need to have opportunities. Um, uh, I think the the world where women and girls have to limit their choices is gone. And uh, for the sake of our daughters, uh, that future needs to be like that. There needs to be opportunities for women. They, they can't. The number of women who are in senior positions in management is too low. The number of people and women in, in politics is too low. Um, there needs to be there needs to be opportunities and the barriers that are in place for women not just our daughters but for any women I think if those barriers are removed it'll make the economy stronger and society a better a better economy and if they came if, if they came to you with a, a business plan uh, what were the first what are the key things you'd be looking for from that business plan to tell whether actually it had legs or not uh, I think a somebody who wants to start a business 
uh, can find a way through whatever the barriers are that are there if they have the energy and the will and the drive to make something happen. So people often, often say, I'd start a business if only I had the funds. You can find the funds. You can, you can get a group of people together and do crowdfunding or you can get some money from a bank or you can get some money from friends or you can, get, you can find a way to get the funds to get something started. People say they might start a business if they had an idea. If we locked ourselves in this room for two hours, you'd walk out with a hundred ideas, good ideas, really good ideas for a business. So all the barriers that people raise saying, I'd start a business if, are not real. The only thing that stops a business being created is the energy, the drive, the self-belief, the self-awareness of the individual or the teams that are, are starting the business. And I think if they have that, uh, then a business can be successful. They can they can find their way over all the all the hurdles that are there. Okay, Michael Carey, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. Enjoyed. It. That's it for the Architects of Business this week. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks too to our guest Michael Carey, our producer Patrick Hohey, and all of the team here at Joe. Our programme is made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. You can go to their website, eoy.ie, to learn more about the finalists for this year. Make sure you don't miss out on future or indeed past editions of the Architects of Business. You can subscribe for free on iTunes, on your favourite Android podcast app, or you can watch the show on YouTube. And while you're there, check out some of Joe's other podcasts, including the Hard Yards on Rugby, the GAA Hour, and our movie show, The Big Review Ski. I'm Ty Genreich. Thank you very much for being with us today, and we hope to see you again soon.